Thank you very much, Mr. Owen Allen and Mr. Abbas Pudrati for that very informative presentation. Among the challenges that information security professionals face nowadays are remote working setup and supply chain attacks. Our next speaker will discuss with us how to deal with this double trouble in cybersecurity. Our speaker is a cybersecurity evangelist with over 16 years of multi-industry experience. In his current role as CTS of Qualys, he is an avid customer advocate, SME and solution architect of the Qualys cloud-based security platform and enables customers globally to make the best out of their cyber security investments. He is also the Regional VP and Managing Director for India of Qualys. Please welcome Mr. Dev Jyoti Prakash. In 1999, we launched the first ever SaaS security solution. Since then, we've been diligently expanding our cloud platform, one IT, security, and compliance app at a time. The result, one integrated cloud-based platform for IT, security, and operations. Today, we extend the unifying power of our cloud platform to EDR. We hope you'll give us a look. So hello and welcome to the second day of the plenary sessions at ISOG Summit Philippines 2021. Hope you guys are enjoying the conference so far. Uh, my name is Deb and I'm the CTSO for Qualys in Asia Pacific. Um, we are actually having a session with fellow individuals from the industry talking about two topics, supply chain attacks and the work from home cyber challenge, things that are of utmost importance to cybersecurity uh, of an organization these days. So the year is 2021 and, and a stronger cyber defense strategy is definitely required to manage the onslaught of cyber threats you know, and intrusions. So we are in the era of uh, constant re-engineering, um, adopting to Herculean efforts in recovering and protecting our data. Of course, notwithstanding implementing standards and compliance, which is pretty much regular, right? So the world drastically is adjusting to confirm to security policies, companies expanding their remote workforce and now have pivoted to new, new economic reality of what's happening around with the pandemic. So what we're doing today is, uh, you know, um, talking about two topics. Let me introduce the speakers first. I think, you know, each one of you can, you know, introduce yourselves. That would be the best thing to do. Uh, Mark, do you want to go first? Sure, thank you, Deb. So my name is Mark. I'm the Group CISO of Mint um, Globe Fintech Innovations. And Mint is the holding company of the, the biggest and largest e-wallet fintech company in the Philippines, Gcash. Mm -hmm. And also I'm the, the CISO of Fuse Lending. Perfect. Thanks. Perfect, thanks, Mark. Gons? Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Gons Gonzalez. I'm the CISO for JG Summit Holdings. Uh, we are one of the largest uh, Filipino conglomerates, and we have operations obviously here in the Philippines, all over Southeast Asia, and ANZ. Brilliant. Deepak, can you hear us? Yeah. Hello, everyone. This is Deepak Naik. Uh, I'm the VP of uh, Cloud Security Platform and Operations at Qualys. Uh, prior to Qualys, I've been a customer of Qualys on the other side for five years, wherein I used to manage the cybersecurity at uh, one of the largest banks in India, Access Bank. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak. Thank you, everyone. So thank you for joining in today. Uh, you know, we all know that CISOs faced a number of challenges in 2020 and 2021, not the least of which is definitely COVID-19 and the mass migration from on-site to remote work. Uh, maybe for the first time, the corporate leadership, you know, just saw how vital the security team is to ensuring the company runs and runs smoothly. <clears throat> Thus, of course, making 2020 and 80% of 2021, the year when the CISO and the cybersecurity teams uh, went from the background to the very forefront of enabling organizational productivity, right? So in 2021, CISOs of course can continue to <clears throat> show how vital their role is 
from risk mitigation to ROI, right? As they tackle the combined challenges of supply chain hacks, ransomware, work from home, and what not to come. So what we are trying to do today is, is a very simple format. We have two burning topics and three questions per topic for each of our panelists member to respond. And our panelists have three to five minutes to respond just so that we ensure you can elaborate on your response. You can also talk until five minutes, that's okay. So <clears throat> this is our first topic, the impact of supply chain hacks. Now supply chain hacks um, has been in the news for probably since SolarWinds hack, right? <clears throat> so security teams entered the year of 2021 trying to make sense out of the solar winds attack and how it could impact their organization, right? Now it's a big coup for hackers to pull off a supply chain attack because it doesn't happen easy. It takes a village to do this, right? Um, so they packaged a malware inside a trusted piece of software. Now government agencies were the first you know, targets of it. And uh, it appears that later dozens of other companies were also impacted. So those affected will definitely spend the next several you know, weeks and months and years figuring out how someone could go undetected for nearly almost a year in their systems, right? So our question around the first wave uh, for supply chain hacks to our panelists, I think we can be begin with Gons. Gons, are you okay to take the first question? Uh, sure. Yeah, so sure. So uh, with, with supply chain, uh, the, the issue there primarily is that uh, your organization does not have control of other organizations. That's obvious, right? Uh, but then again, if you look into you know uh, the relationships between you, either as a provider or a, the end customer of somebody else, is is something that's you know um, that's marred in you know uh, legal legalese and you know um, working or corporate relationships, right? So it's kind of difficult to navigate sometimes how you want to handle these things, right? So. So that's why we have uh, we we need to introduce you know uh, third party risk management programs right? like so that they were they'll be the ones to guide us in terms of um, dealing with uh, uh, the third parties that we work with, and so I think one of the things that that also needs to be put uh, in context is that when we do our risk assessment, our risk management is that you know we should also put uh, uh, include all of these third party risks right. So we need to also um, uh, consider uh, the the vulnerabilities of these uh, partners, the threats to these uh, to these vulnerabilities, and you know what is the overall risk that you know the threat will you know uh, accomplish or exploit the the vulnerability. So what we do mainly is uh, in in my case, what we do is uh, we we have a vulnerability management program, and then um, this is obviously. Uh, uh, what we use here, the, our main tool is Qualys, of course. And then we feel that once we know uh, what our vulnerabilities are, and then uh, marry that with uh, your, your normal telemetry, like for example, your asset management, your, your network traffic, et cetera. If you do these things together, I feel if you have uh, good visibility across the corporation and across boundaries of the corporation, uh, crossing into, you know, wherever you're interfacing, with your third-party partners, is when you know you could you could now appreciate what types of risks you need to prioritize and to remediate. So I guess uh, that's how we approach uh, the the supply chain uh, issue. Thanks, Perfect. Guys. Thanks, Guns. Yeah. So I think that's a good good point. Um, now moving on to the next question to Mark. Mark, customers, you know, clearly cannot know if a trusted vendor to them gave them a piece of malware, right? Now, how do you prepare for these things? You know, are you going to ask your uh, vendors for more assurance, right? When you say more assurance, of course, they would have been presenting you with some sort of assurance already, but are you going to ask them more? Are you going to ask your trusted vendors to give you more visibility into their build environments, health status? How do you plan on addressing this with your vendors? Sure, so I think Gon um, touch upon some of the items that I actually wanted to highlight. So as end users, um, we definitely put a significant level of trust to our partners or vendors, right? So for me, really three things. Um, we perform assessment of, of the security posture and maturity of our vendors or partners. 
So be that in pre-engagement or during operational engagements. And on top of that, we do continuous monitoring, right? Cool. Um, these are all part of our overall third party as, was, as what Gons mentioned earlier, um, vendor management program. And hopefully you know, they meet that desired level of which there are little to no issues or gaps. So that's the first item, right? Second item is really, I'd like to have visibility and transparency from our partners and vendors. And I'd like to be given like an, say for example, our seemingly, um, an early heads up of a seemingly harmless incident, be it in IT or in operations, especially if there's a likelihood that we are impacted. Because right. you'll never know if that seemingly harmless incident is really the start of the big catastrophic incident. You, you, you'll never know, right? Yeah. I think the third item for me is, and I think it's more of a wish list, to be honest, is if that vendor supplies us, say, a software, um, be it a security software or, or an IT software, I think it's as in relation to what you know, we're discussing about SolarWinds, it would be ideal that we also know what are the ingredients, quote unquote, ingredients of that software, right? Um, and I'd like to be informed of you know, how they perform their oversight and governance of, for each of those ingredients, because yeah. you'll never know if that piece of software that you deployed onto your organization of different other softwares that's, that did not originate from the vendor that you're actually having engagement on. So yeah, that's pretty much you know, the, my, my, my three key things on, on that question. Got it. But, but Mark, do you plan on asking, asking your GRC team to look, look at uh, new ways of making sure that your trusted vendors continue to give you that confidence? Will you do that? Sure, definitely. So, um, and, and this is where pretty much, you know, um, close collaboration with our vendors is, is key, right? And that's why we want that level of transparency as well as visibility from our vendors. And that's basically, you know, as part of our oversight and governance, which will be part of the overall GRC. You're right on that one, Deb. Brilliant. Thanks. Thank you. It would be interesting for me to see because me as a vendor to both Mark and Gons, I would like to see one day you know, are those questions really tough? And if they're tough, then, you know, it's good if, if, they, if they're tough, right? Okay, so moving on to Deepak. Deepak, you know, you are, uh, you know, responsible for a large cloud service that tons of customers use daily to protect their infrastructure. Now, our question to you is, you know, look at old school cyber hygiene, right? That's never going to go away. So a fully patched system is also vulnerable if it is running a compromised software or a software that is exposed to be compromised with an SSC attack. So what additional efforts are you building into your SecOps, right? Now that you have to deal with these things, right? So what do you suggest you know, people to look at? Yeah, so Dave, uh, you need, uh, uh, you know, a single strategy will not solve all your ills uh, of the supply chain. Uh, what you need to do is shift left as much as possible, uh, wherein, I hope I'm audible. I'm, I'm sorry, just a minute. My kid, my kid is wailing. Yeah. So you need to shift as left as possible, wherein uh, you will ensure that uh, the, the components that you choose in building your softwares, including the third party components, you have a good hold of these components when you are building these systems. So one of the things that our team does well is ensuring that these components are scanned uh, during the build cycles. So all the, the golden images that we are uh, that we retain uh, our repository that we have for the softwares. We ensure that these are scanned uh, uh, during the build phase so that we can reject or stall anything which is not compliant to our security policies. So this gives us a good lead rather than you know trying to do that in the production environment which needs maintenance cycles and outages uh you if you kind of build these strong policies at the build phase it gives you a lot of control uh in terms of you know uh, what goes into your production now the second uh, important aspect is do you have a tool which gives you visibility to all the corners of your production environment uh one tool wherein uh, irrespective of your data centers, because see today we are running in uh, hybrid environments uh, due to the pandemic. 
a lot of us have moved to the cloud because of the logistics challenges of procuring and deploying hardware. So now in this case, uh, you have another third party which got introduced in terms of the SaaS services which have got, got introduced. Now, do you have tools which you give, give you visibility of this hybrid ecosystem and give you that single pane of glass to kind of monitor the vulnerabilities which are across your ecosystem? Uh, then based on the, the criticality of the information which is there on these assets, you can take the call in terms of what is important for your organization to be remediated first. So I, I think uh, it's, it's about uh, being proactive and at the same time, uh, having good monitoring of your ecosystem, uh, which will ensure that you are ahead of the game and the curve. Got it. Brilliant. Thank you. Thank you, Deepak, for your response there. Uh, I think I'll change gears and move back to Mark again. So Mark, um, we did a survey, you know, we actually you know, ran a survey and a survey found that even when the hackers did provide a key to unlock data from for a you know for a you know, exchange of a ransom payment you know information was corrupted in nearly 80 percent of the cases also about two-thirds of these companies reported significant drops in revenue um, you know uh, uh, following these things so uh, the, the question to you is should an organization be paying a ransom if yes, why? And if not, why not? And I think you know you are. We are we are going to await a response from you, given that you guys are a fintech, right? So this actually has a great uh, insight, you know, because companies who are similar to you or are in BFSI and fintech would look up to you know these things. Yeah, I guess yeah. This is really a good question because it's, it's really also timely because I think ransomware is like getting the heat of, of the news out there, right? Um, there's definitely some perspective either way, right? Even that's a yes or a no, yeah. but my position is no, right? Um, but be sure that you can bring up your operations in time. I guess that's, that's where, that's, that's, that's where the, the key is. We all say this in security and it's, it's really, it isn't really a matter of time, but of, of if, but a matter of when. And so the role of security is really anchored towards making it so difficult to hack or compromise an organization, right? And also making an organization resilient um, should a major incident happen, such as ransomware attacks. So no is a response that says a message, we are, a, a, we are a resilient as an organization. So that's, that's pretty much how I, I, I look at it. Um, you need to build all of these capabilities and one of which really is resiliency, right? So more on, on top of security, you need to also be a resilient organization. And yeah, that, that's, that's my position. You know what, uh, while, while, while I'm pretty convinced with this response, some of our listeners might still be waiting for an yes. Yeah. <laughs> yes, <laughs> of course. <laughs> so, okay, this is a tough thing, right? So you balance between a yes and a no on when to pay a ransom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So going back to you again, um, you know, consolidating, uh, you know, all these efforts that's required. So if you want to really extort millions of dollars from a large company, right, mm -hmm. you cannot do it alone. It will take a village of hackers with advanced computer skills, right, right, who usually probably hang out in the dark web. So it's very difficult to get into these criminal forums. You know, you kind of have to prove that you are a criminal yourself, right, by committing some act of cybercrime that they give you as a, in a coupon to entry into their ecosystem. Right? Sure. So what do you think we know? You know we, are, we are the enterprises. We really sometimes do not have the information that's out there in the dark web. So what's the ecosystem there and how does a parallel internet exist and thrive so well? Well, I guess it comes down to the financial viability of all these things, uh, especially what we're talking about here, Deb, which is ransomware. I think it's been uh, very rewarding for those who are involved in it so that, you know, they, they really thrive. You know, as you said, it's an, in an ecosystem or in, you know, there's already an existing supply chain from those who create the ransomware itself up until to those who sort of like distribute it, you know, across the internet. So, um, so uh, I, I think that, that, uh, that knowledge in itself is enough for us to move, right? 
I don't think we uh, we don't have any. Uh, I guess none none of us have the uh, very good capability of you know having all of those sock puppets uh, in the dark web, right? And you know, listening to all these conversations. Even if you do um, have you know uh, if you if you subscribe to a threat intelligence service that you know purports to be on the dark web, it's not yet enough, right? Until you really know uh, the the persons who are actually doing this, then you you don't know a hundred percent. So. The position is always, you know, um, as uh, uh, as Mark said, you know, is to become resilient. Number one in your operations, ensure that you know, uh, if something happens, the blast radius is is manageable and contained to a very small portion of the business. And then, you know, uh, from a defensive tax tactic, you need to make uh, you you need to make it more expensive for the ransomware gangs to infiltrate you, right? Uh, you know what the you know the uh, the bear in the woods store, right? I don't need to outrun the bear. I just need to outrun the other people who are who's also you know running away from the bear. Uh, that needs to say that you know uh, if we do very good cyber hygiene, and if we um, if we do our defense well, make make our defense more expensive for intruders to come in, then they will go to the next target, right? Obviously, that's not ideal, but that's how it is, right? So you protect first your own, and then probably uh, through shared intelligence, you know, share uh, your knowledge throughout the industry, and then uh, we can protect ourselves together, and then you know, make it uh, not worth their while to, hopefully, in the future, not worth anybody's while to do <laughs> ransomware. Yes, thanks. Yeah, good, good, good perspective there, guys. Thank you. So, um, Deepak, do you want to add? something to that response, because I had a feeling that you might like to add something. You know, I actually have another question that came to me when uh, Gond was speaking about, you know, responding to this question. So do we really, so we do have threat intel platforms, threat intel that we can consume, but on a scale of one to 10, where do you think the TIPs or the TIs have the, you know, have the information? So do you think they have it all or they have it some, or do we still need to add something to what we get from them? So they uh, from a threat intel point of view, uh, what I have been seeing over the last uh, 15 years is threat, info, uh, threat intel is uh, typically either it is too generic uh, so that and it is too, too heavy for you to kind of ingest and uh, take an action out of it. So most of the threat intel that we are all receiving is not actionable. Uh, you need actionable threat intel, uh, which is relevant to the industry that you are in. Uh, so threat intel is also industry specific wherein uh, and region specific. So these two contexts is very important for threat intelligence uh, because we, uh, so I, I see uh, threat intel to be predominantly in, in one language, uh, wherein there is no restriction on the, 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 you know, the dark web community to be in a single language, right? They can use any language to ensure that they exchange information uh, and uh, they perpetrate this crime. So I, I, I think uh, uh, threat intel has to evolve. Uh, it has to have that local context. It has to be actionable. Uh, this can only happen when the community comes together. It is very ensure, very important that we have uh, a lot of these forums wherein people meet and share ideas. And uh, this kind of you know triggers the formation of a local threat intelligence exchange, uh, mm -hmm. which can be hosted by a community. Uh, because if you see most of these commercial threat intelligence feeds have been started from some initiative and predominantly these initiatives have been driven from the from from established and uh, you know developed economies uh, i think this has to be done at uh, uh, you know at at a local level so that uh, you know if there is a targeted because we are living in a world wherein uh, we have nation state actors who are uh, ensuring that countries are getting targeted and uh, within countries, there are certain critical industries like uh, we have seen that in the US pipeline uh, exploit, which has happened. So obviously that's a very focused targeted attack. So we need to ensure uh, and understand that the industry that we are in, let's say banking, FinTech, uh, the, the power distribution, the water supply, the government institutions, uh, they need to understand this and have uh, you know, ISACs, local ISACs, uh, you know, information security, uh, local councils. I, I saw that, I, I see this.
to be done really well in in us wherein we have industry specific threat exchanges yeah. uh, i strongly recommend this to be done by uh, you know uh, each country at a local level uh, then you know i think there can be a good convergence of all of this into ensuring that uh, at a larger level we have an actionable intelligence aggregating correct correct i think i think to agree there because you know in all my communication with uh, you know threat intel suppliers i have seen that hackers usually do not do new things they do the same things over and over again so if there is a collaboration industry specific like you brought up isaac and i have heard about fs isaac which is very specific to financial services if they are at the local level if you know if uh, uh, corporations and companies Uh, and agencies in the Philippines, you know, build something local that could then they could share information before somebody else can get impacted and it becomes more widespread. Okay, perfect. Thanks. So, uh, Deepak, I actually had a follow up question there. Uh, yeah. So, uh, you know, we usually think that cloud isn't a target of ransomware because a lot of my communication with CISOs sometimes they look at cloud as an anti ransomware effort. They, you know, what if I move things to cloud? then i'm not having to fight ransomware the same way that i have to fight if they are on prem so you know but there are three critical aspects that can expose cloud data also to ransomware mm-hmm. uh, i i look at ransomware infected file sharing services as one of them right or ransom cloud attacks that we recently you know heard and saw some shift happening and even ransomware targeting cloud vendors themselves right so why is ransomware targeting the cloud uh, uh- Dave, can you repeat the last section? I think I had a network issue. No, I'm saying, um, you know, we usually think that cloud is not the target of ransomware, right? So what I'm asking is, why do you think ransomware is now targeting the cloud? Yeah, so uh, so ransomware is targeting the cloud. Uh, we have seen uh, so cloud is a reality. I think uh, we cannot run away from cloud and SaaS. Uh, cloud and SaaS gives you, uh, you know, give businesses the ability to focus on their core areas, the core function areas. Uh, you know, traditionally there is a lot of time, money, and energy which goes into setting up uh, data centers, managing data centers. I've done this in my past experience, wherein you have to wait on uh, the entire. So as you said, uh, we have a disruption in the supply chain. So setting up these data centers is not possible in today's time, wherein there is a chip shortage, there is a disk shortage. so people are adopting cloud uh, you know for a lot of their expansion so in fact uh, you know qualis uh, I'll, i'll share our story uh, we have expanded in the last one year predominantly on one uh, you know on on cloud services on public cloud service providers uh, because uh, we've been we've seen that you know it is cutting down our uh, you know delivery times by almost uh, you know 2/3 uh, we are able to deliver services faster to uh, you know different uh, you know customers uh also you know cloud gives you the flexibility that you can have uh you know a tenant in the country of your choice we have a lot of data localization requirements which is leading to you know uh these local data centers coming up in different regions and countries and so that's that's the new reality companies to grow faster will adopt cloud and the cloud also increases your attack surface because uh, the shared responsibility model of a cloud is not understood by the customer uh, there have been a lot of early adopters of cloud who have internal competencies in uh, building services on the cloud uh, and uh, securing them uh, but now all this pandemic infused migration um, has left a lot of gaps open in the ecosystem which the customer uh, first has focused on uh, getting the services up uh, that is the availability aspect and security is becoming an afterthought for for them <coughs> i'm sorry uh, a lot of this also eliminates from them not understanding the shared responsibility model so they they are relying a lot on their cloud service provider for the security of these services and uh, now is where the attackers have uh, we have seen that in a couple of public cases of uh, insider threat so now uh, uh, you know the insiders also it it makes it is very easy for them to let's say do a data exfiltration on the cloud uh, because they don't have to come to your physical office or your data center to kind of take the data out right yeah. so that's 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 much easier for the insider today as well as the outsider because the the attack surface is now public okay 
And uh, if you have not configured it right, uh, which is the case of a lot of these companies which have done the uh, you know migration off late, uh, they are able to kind of you know scan these surfaces. Uh, so today, you have ransomware as, as a service, uh, wherein you can uh, and these services are you know offered as as a SaaS product, yeah. uh, and the subscription can be uh, had for as less as a thousand dollars for a year. So Deepak, I, I actually have a copy of a prize book of such a provider. It starts from $40. For exactly. Per, so per it day. is as less as $40 a month. <laughs> so uh, with these services, you're, you, you don't even need to be dedicated. You know, you just run a scan on a platform uh, and these platforms will, uh, you know, ensure that your entire attack surface is uh, detected, including your public clouds, including your shadow IT. Uh, mm-hmm. You might not be aware because uh, entities are not investing in uh, in assets, uh, you know, asset discovery tools, uh, cyber security, you know, cyber assets. Uh, people don't have it in one place, so they also don't consider as the cloud, uh, you know, services as their assets. So this is where the the gaps start building, uh, wherein uh, they have forgotten an S3 bucket which they have kept online, and eventually, uh, you know, it, the effort to identify. In fact, I was just checking the other day on Hacker One and Bug Bounty in terms of the skill sets required to do this. It's 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 very less. The entry barriers to do this uh, discoveries and exploits are very less. So even a uh, uh, someone out of this college, he can kind of stumble upon these and uh, kind of you know get a bug bounty over there. And uh, more than bug bounty, I think on the other side, it's very easy. The the ecosystem, the dark web ecosystem, has evolved uh, with cryptocurrencies. So people, uh, you know, are easily able to take these, uh, you know, detections and discoveries and sell it there as their wares for, uh, you know, hundred dollars, five hundred dollars. It's very easy uh, without any traceability to this financial transactions. So cryptocurrencies have made hacking more, uh, you know, anonymous. You can sit anywhere and kind of get paid in, um, you know, half a Bitcoin or less than that or whatever and uh, be completely anonymous and sell your wares. Yeah, I think half a Bitcoin is still very expensive today. Yeah, yeah. so I'm, I'm talking about the times when uh, it was still a couple of hundreds of dollars, but uh, I, I think it's it's Bitcoin is crazy now. Yeah. Perfect. M- Mark Gons, do you want to add something to uh, this topic? Before yeah, you- I, I, okay. yeah I, I think uh, Deepak nailed that one um basically um i i i i think also it's obvious that companies are pretty much moving some or most of their systems on the cloud right so as probably part of their digital transformation activities and so there's a shift of target i think this is also similar to 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 end users or workers right because now they're working remote and so there's also a shift of target uh, for our side, we also see that there's a shift of target, not just onto us, but also sh- targeting our end customers. And so we put some level of focus on that front as well. And I think Deepak is right on saying there's a, there's a skill set factor here when we talk about cloud. Um, for, for me, cloud is still fairly new. And uh, yeah, I, I mean, some of some others will say, no, no, that's that's been there for quite some time now. But there's definitely a skill set that that also need to adapt right yeah. one of the one of the major reasons of misconfigurations in cloud and mind you misconfigurations nearly well nearly account for all successful attacks on cloud be it data breaches right misconfigurations is on the top right and one of the major reasons of misconfigurations is due to inexperienced staff yeah Right. So and so, given this, attackers definitely know this, and so they will definitely exploit that weakness. And probably that's one of the reasons why you know they're, they're you know, uh, targeting cloud as, as part of ransomware attacks. Perfect. Yeah, makes sense. Uh, any parting points on this, Gons? Before we move on to the next topic. Yeah. So so Deb, yes. Uh, yeah, so cloud is a different animal altogether, right? So mm-hmm. although cloud does give us some sort of like a protection uh, away from ransomware, it still is, you know, vulnerable as with anything else. Everything's vulnerable to, to ransomware. Yeah. Um, and then, you know, I guess, you know, uh, coming from Deepak and what Mark said, you know, uh, it's all about, you know, knowing uh, how to work the cloud, right? Uh, to, to our advantage. And I think um, 
if we just take the time to you know uh, upskill our people, make uh, make them more aware, and then make them uh, more proficient in handling these uh, these these tools, I think yeah. we're off to a better uh, cloud uh, secure, uh, secure cloud environment. Perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Gons. So before we move on to the next topic, I wanted to reiterate for folks who are attending this session. If you have any questions, you could drop the questions on the Q&A window. And at the end of this session, we'll take up you know, questions if we have uh, time remaining. If we are unable to take questions because of time, we'll make sure that we respond back to you on an email. OK, so moving on to the next topic is remote workforce cyber problem. Now, this is not a new topic, right? This is what we have been all champions around in the last 17, 18 months. So a preface to this topic is, you know, we all know that workers aren't going to be returning to office anytime in 2021, probably now. Some have started, of course, but it's not in the same usual uh, volume, right? So work from home is going to be in place until there is a full vaccine rollout. And in many countries, they, have, they are done with both the vaccines. Like in India, we are done with both the vaccines. In Australia, they are done with 90% on uh, you know, the first vaccine. So there are you know, uh, countries with different level of progress around there. That means you know, whatsoever cybersecurity system that are incorporated now are going to have to stay right in effect or be modified for workers who are in a hybrid model for work slash office, right? And cyber criminals know this, right? And so they will target remote workers with things like phishing and other targeted attacks. So this topic is going to cover that problem. So I think we can begin with uh, Mark this time. So Mark, what are the top work from home related cyber challenges that the CISO within you wants to fix now? And, and let us know if vendors that you work with are actually you know, purpose building their offerings to make this happen and help you. Sure. Um, I guess, how do I ensure that my employees are somewhat, uh, for the lack of a better term, paranoid uh, <laughs> when it comes to cyber and infosec? So, to, so pretty much people is also a security control in, 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 in my perspective. So I, I'd, I'd like to, to build on to that because pretty much they're, you know, they're, everybody is out there probably using their BYODs, you know, the personal devices as part of their work. Um, again, as I mentioned earlier, um, I think visibility is really key, right? And so we need to be able to be to have visibility on all of the, the activities with focus on unusual behaviors happening on, you know, on those work device, yeah. if you will, right? Um, in addition, uh, we need to be able to completely ensure that every device is like compliant or hardened mm -hmm. in a way, right? And I think vendors such as Qualys, you know, will, will help address visibility aspect in addition to ensuring that every, that every device is being assessed and enable remediation activities for issues and gaps identified. Yeah. Perfect, perfect, thanks, thanks, Mark. That was a good response. Uh, it gives us a perspective on the fact that, you know, something that we constantly keep listening, you know, you cannot yeah. control what you cannot see. And we sometimes think, you know, that we might have conquered that problem, but I still continue to see that, you know, uh, half your problem is solved if you know what's the problem, right? And knowing the problem, right. uh, you know, is dependent on how you are looking at your problems, right? So you have things on-prem, in cloud, mobile devices, complex assets like API, applications, containers, cloud, right? So <clears throat> these days, a visibility of your infrastructure is a whole different meaning. Thanks, thanks for that perspective. So moving on to Gons, uh, Gons, I have the same question, but in a slightly different coating. So, you know, phishing, of course, would not be the only problem. Of course, that's been there for ages and we can yeah. never, <clears throat> I don't see an end to phishing anytime soon. Now, these remote workers will continue to work from home, right? With a device that's less secure, like Mark even pointed out, they could be BYOD or gifted to you by your cousins because <laughs> you had a birthday coming up. Yeah. What so that is. So, so, you know, so these will lead to problems for network security, right? Do you think being able to consolidate the endpoint security vendor stack, right, helps? Yes, uh, definitely. Uh, to answer that last question, right? Yes, it would help them uh, because you don't want to to have a complex situation. You know, just uh, managing your endpoint protection. You know, 
complexity okay. as we all know is the enemy of security so so you wanted to keep it as simple as possible uh, so that you could manage it and then you could you know protect the endpoints so yes yeah, so phishing is is not the only uh, threat out there obviously there's many more you know you could just go to a website and then you could be a victim of a drive by you know um, malware downloading into your system you know executing that javascript uh, on your browser so there there are many um, many things that are you know <laughs> i guess uh, it's a wild west out there especially yeah. when you push your distributed now your workforce is distributed and now are are working outside of the protection of your network perimeter right so so it's more uh, more logical to you know collapse your security stack up in uh, onto that endpoint so so you're you're securing essentially the endpoint because you know there's no more ips there's no more firewall uh, obviously aside from the ones that are uh, the in the home network but that's you know something easily <laughs> trivially you know um, uh, intruded upon by attackers and you know on the other side of the keyboard, as Spark said, you need to train up, you know, the people who are working these endpoints. And so you're like, you know, you're developing a human firewall, so to speak. And so we, we, we use words like, you know, zero trust, you know, when uh, just in time, you know, uh, access, etc. So those things come into fruition when you think about how to secure uh, the endpoint and, you know, how to secure the way that we're working now. Um, uh, during pandemic and you know even post pandemic because I, I we see that you know most people will now prefer to work you know some some days in the office some days from home or even you know full remote work so i think we should you know um adapt our security measures to that uh to that new uh, way of working yeah yeah makes sense god so you know in fact if colleagues asks me to come back to office i'm going to tell them I made a significant spending in building my new office room in the house. <laughs> Not until I can, you know, recover the cost there. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, gods. Uh, that's a good good perspective to look at. Um, Deepak, now I have one final question for you. Uh, <clears throat> same topic around the same thoughts. You know how um, <clears throat> Gons also made it evident. Um, so when I when I look at technologies that you should consider, you know to meet the 2021 cybersecurity challenge, right? Like zero trust, Mark spoke about it, Don spoke about it, VDI, tokenization, multi-factor authentication, comprehensive endpoint management, patching, uh, endpoint protection, detection and response, data loss prevention, you know, user behavior monitoring, and it doesn't stop, right? So can't we just have a simpler way to security? Why, or, or, or do you think we are confusing between comprehensivity and complexity yeah so uh, I, I think there is no silver bullet to security uh, i think but uh, most of uh, the industry is evolving to address these challenges uh, previously you know uh, we knew that you know the endpoints were sitting in a secure network with network access control uh, you were there was defense in depth in your corporate network so before the endpoint even could touch uh, the internet it had to cross these multiple layers and then kind of go through your proxy and then you have your content scanning uh, and eventually you know you you touch the internet but that is not the case today when the endpoint is uh, in a lot of these cases because of the pandemic uh, you know uh, companies have en enabled their employees to use uh, work using their personal devices okay their home laptops so with that background uh, you need solutions which can, uh, uh, and unfortunately, the, the control uh, elements which were working in your corporate environment today, they were not meant to be exposed over the internet, apart from your VPN and a couple of other solutions. Uh, none of these solutions were uh, thought of as SaaS solutions. So now this brings about a challenge. What do you do of the devices uh, which are connecting from your home environment, from your home Wi-Fi? So this is where uh, you know you need to kind of reassess the landscape in terms of what is uh, what is at risk. So starting off with as as simple as whether you know the the cybersecurity posture of the endpoint which is connecting to you, so that you can take an informed decisions whether you can uh, onboard that endpoint or not. So you need comprehensive solutions which can do a vulnerability assessment, 
Uh, it can do a patch deployment to ensure that, uh, let's assume there is no option, it's an important employee to you. Can you bring the cybersecurity posture to a minimum baseline so that you can, uh, you can allow business to function? So uh, these solutions, which, which have a comprehensive cybersecurity approach, uh, I think uh, Qualys has, has been able to build over, over the years uh, different capabilities. So today with a single agent, you are able to do the uh, vulnerability assessment. You can identify uh, the risks which are more important to you uh, because uh, you have to bear in mind that these endpoints are there in the home network. You don't know the bandwidth available to them and uh, you don't know the controls which you can uh, you know enforce on those endpoints because uh, the you know the software is entirely a different landscape there so this is where uh, you know saas solutions will enable you uh, to enforce these controls on any endpoint so yes uh, i think i'll i'll take from gons that uh, you know uh, a zero trust is not a single solution uh, it is a it's a philosophy it's an approach uh, you need to add the, the building blocks of, of these different solutions to build that comprehensive uh, zero trust. So irrespective of the user, uh, irrespective of the endpoint, you should be able to assess the security posture and you should be able to allow them to uh, access deny. So let's say, uh, you know, today uh, there, is, there is a very important aspect of privileged users. So today administrators are logging from their, your Active Directory administrator is logging from his home network. So you need to ensure that you understand these user profiles and uh, incrementally add the security layers to kind of ensure that that access, uh, the privileged access can be protected. It could be just in time, uh, it could be uh, virtual desktops. Uh, so I think it's, uh, you, you don't have a silver bullet here. You need to assess the, the landscape and uh, uh, have the users uh, understand the business use and apply corresponding controls. Got it, Deepak. <clears throat> Makes a lot of sense. And I was just thinking, you know, for uh, consumers who are motivated to secure their organizations, and they're like, okay, give me a baseline of the kind of security investments I should make. And uh, if they were dependent on Google, like I am, <clears throat> and you go and say, security tools for work from home security, you know, you can you can probably keep scrolling for a week. There's no end to it. Okay, fantastic. So. Uh, Mark, Gons, do you want to add to anything on my last question? Because I have a feeling that, you know, we can actually have more content on the last question that I had asked Deepak and on something around, you know, there's a, there are just tons of tools out there that promise you that they can help you secure work from home. Uh, are we, you know, mixing comprehensivity against complexity? Gons, you want to go first? Gons, you're on mute if you're speaking. Yep. Yeah. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, so yes. Uh, you know, it would be, you know, one of the um, one of the things as humans, right? We we want uh, we want shiny new things, right? So, yeah. uh, it's it's not different for any security practitioner. There are new tools out there, whether it be commercial off the shelf or uh, free open source. There are many many tools, right? But then again, if you do understand how complex it is and how uh, how complex it could be when you stack all of these things together. Uh, you're not actually protecting anything, right? So uh, I go for simplicity over complexity at any time. As I've said, you know, complexity is, is, is our enemy. Uh, if it's more complex system, if there are more moving parts, then it's a less secure system. I think that's that's one of the tenets right there. So in the home. If you if you if you have, for example, a a good you know endpoint protection platform, uh, and then you're you know and you're you're managing your as as my friend Mark said your paranoia right mm -hmm. the user paranoia is very important there because then you know you'd be uh, you you your behavior will be a little bit safer. Meaning to say you're not go you're not downloading you know stuff from untrusted sites. You're not just opening links that you know unknown senders you know email you or or something like that right so it's about you know user behavior and then it's about you know uh, keeping your uh, security simple enough so that you could manage it properly 
uh, it's it's easier to manage some one thing 100% than to ma manage you know five things at you know 20% each right so uh, one thing is more effective than you know five yeah i think you have spoken as a true practitioner there gons yeah yeah gons i'll completely support you uh, i think keeping it simple is very essential because cyber security programs need to evolve and incrementally mature uh, complexity kind of stalls the project and you know you need to put in a lot of effort to kind of come out of that uh, that hole you dig for yourself Mark, do you want to add some parting comments on this topic? Sure. Um, guys, I think you guys have really brought up all the, you know, all the, the good things. And I really, I'm not sure what, what, what else can I add now. But my take to really, when, when I talk about security as a whole, right? My take to that is the tenets of security is still the same. I mean, so it isn't a tool or a product, a software or an architecture, or even just a process, right? It's yeah. pretty much a collection of all of these, right? Um, Looking at the, on the enterprise concept, right? It's, I also observed that there are cases um, that security or, or even IT professionals underestimate the basic activities, or should I say the right foundation of things, which in turn enables security. So I'll give you an example. For example, a good IT architecture and design actually in turn enables security. You don't need a tool, but you have, if you have the right design and, if, and architecture yeah. enables security, right? Now, if your security team or your, or your IT have a near real-time accurate inventory of their IT assets across, that enables security. Don't yeah. need, right? That's not a, even a security software in a way. Exactly. Right? So um, now when we drill down to, down to solutions, right? Well, for security solutions, where does it stop? I think that's, that's also one, one question there. My response to that is, is that it doesn't. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think Deepak mentioned that earlier, right? Uh, <clears throat> we need to continuously evolve. Right. And so also we live in a world that's constantly changing and evolving. And, and, and Deepak is right. Now, if we zoom into IT, the advancement of technology is so exponential. And so security must also keep pace, not just to the speed of business, but also technology. And right? from the likes of like AI, now partner AI with quantum computing, what kind of, what kind of superpower <laughs> threat actor can do, you know? Uh, with the, with those kind of tools, right? So we need to also keep up. Um, but I, I guess from holistically, if there's a solution that at least provides an orchestrated view and visibility across the enterprise, across even if your endpoints are outside your office network, right? That would be the way to go, I think, um, as it provides ample time for your security guys, security professionals, to really focus on real incidents, you know, without the noise, and more value-added security work. Right. So that's 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 pretty much my feedback there. Perfect, Mark. You know, you you were spot on on the, you know, with your comment. Okay, so just to summarize, you know, Mark and Gons and Deepak towards the end, I had this uh, sense of the fact that, you know, of course, stay away from complexity, build a comprehensive infrastructure. Uh, Mark focused on how it is not just always about getting a new tool or something, but it's also about getting a new, you know, making improvements in architecture also is a step towards security. You know, so my bottom line to that would be, so let's look at secure by design, you know, instead of making security like an onion that is security over layers and thinking about it towards the end or slapping on security at the end and not, you know, having a, a theme of building it in, right? So that's a good, good point. Okay, so I think we are uh, pretty much on time to conclude this uh, session and we have tons of great questions. Uh, what I'll do is I'll pick up a question and I'll either try to respond to them myself or I'll hand it over to one of you guys to you know, respond. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, you know, being such a wonderful speaker. And uh, I'm sure we'll meet up again on another interesting topic in the future. Thank you.